Hello, it's Randy Rhodes. Here's a clip from our show, and go to randyrhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a sticker podcast. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's hey. a segment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. Every critic, every detractor will have to bow down to President Trump. It's everyone who's ever doubted Donald, whoever disagreed, whoever challenged him. It is the ultimate revenge to become the most powerful man in the universe. Oh, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord spl- split you, honey. Oh, bye bye, Felicia. <laughs> Uh, I guess uh, they'll replace Omarosa as soon as they figure out what the hell she did. You know, there are so many articles out there about no one knows what she did. That and, and the New York Times had the best one. The New York Times, what Omarosa did best, get fired. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently she's been fired from everything she's ever attempted to do. It's just so fabulously strange. Uh, but uh, she, how outrageous. I mean, how how confrontational and how... How irritating do you have to be to get fired by Donald Trump at the White House? I mean, it's almost she stood out as an embarrassment at the Trump White House. That should be impossible to do. And yet she did it. It's 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 unbelievable. So bye bye. Bye bye. She she, uh, you know, outlived uh, Anthony Scaramucci. Right. Uh, and she had all the charm and sophistication of Sarah Sanders uh, over there. She had uh, the cuddliness of a Steve Bannon. She outlived a guy who was willing to take $15 million to kidnap a guy from Pennsylvania and uh, give him. To- so, you know, she did OK for herself over at that Trump White House because, uh, you know, she says she didn't get fired. And that all of us and anybody who reports what happened there are liars, but she's a truth teller. And what's really fascinating is, you know, she she told Megyn Kelly, when Megyn Kelly uh, was still over at Fox, she interviewed uh, Omarosa. Uh, as soon as it became known that Omarosa was going to get some job, some damn job at the White House, it turns out that the job at the White House that Omarosa got was created for Omarosa. There had never been a job like that in the White House, and yet she got paid the maximum White House salary, almost $180,000 a year she got. So it was interesting, you know, that she decided to tell Megyn Kelly this wasn't her first time serving her country and that she had uh, been part of the Clinton-Gore White House and she had worked for both Bill Clinton and for Al Gore. And I did not know that and I had to go look it up. And it turns out she was fired by Bill Clinton twice, moved to a different office because the people in the office couldn't stand her. And she was creating uh, contretemps and uh, people wanted to slug her and she was in their face and she was very bossy and uh, for no good reason. She apparently was in charge of responding to, uh, you know, uh, not responding to, but counting RSVPs. Yeah, invitations would go out and her job at the Clinton White House was to count and tally the RSVPs, like who would come and who was not going to come. And uh, that was her job. And then she went and worked for Al Gore's office, um, and uh, she she was removed from Al Gore's office as well. Um, let's see, why? Uh, let's see, see, see. 2004. Oh, no. She, when she worked for Al Gore, quote, her exact title was scheduling correspondent. Her job was to respond to invitations, but she didn't do her job, and it got everybody in trouble, said a former Al Gore staffer. But when she worked for Clinton... Um, she was asked to leave as quickly as possible. She was so disruptive, said Cheryl Shavers, the former undersecretary for technology at the Commerce Department, where Amorosa worked for several weeks in 2000. One woman wanted to slug her. She apparently was banished from four different jobs in two years with the Clinton administration. And uh, here's what Lion Amorosa had the nerve to tell Megyn Kelly. Joining me now, Omarosa Manigault who was just named Assistant to the President and Director of Communications for the Office of Public Liaison. It is a, it's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, because it's made up. What, what does it mean? Title. What, what does, does it, it mean, mean Omarosa? 
You know, a public engagement is so important, particularly to President-elect Trump, because he wants to connect with Americans. He wants to hear what their issues are in their communities, and we're going to fight for them. And so my role is to go into the communities and continue an extension of the work that I was doing already on the campaign and with the National Diversity Coalition. Now, what's interesting about you is that this is not your first time working in the White House. The last time, it was for a Democratic administration and it Vice was. President Al Gore, right? I worked for Gore and I was Deputy Associate Director of Presidential Personnel for Bill Clinton. Wow. And, and obviously you <laughs> no. voted for, I imagine, Bill Clinton. I did. And I you did, were, in fact. Were, were you a Barack Obama supporter, too? I was. You know, traditionally, African Americans have been Democrats. And um, I think that Democrats have taken advantage and taken for granted the African American vote. And you are seeing a huge movement of African Americans moving to the Republican Party. And I'm one of them. I'm a Trumplican. Good luck with that, Omarosa. Good luck with that. So she was fired uh, four times from uh, the Bill Clinton administration. The last job she was asked to leave after just a few weeks as quickly as possible because she was so disruptive. And Al Gore, for Al Gore, she worked, uh, you know, uh, tallying RSVPs. Now, Donald Trump has fired her a total of four times now. He fired her three times on The Apprentice and then yesterday. But she is saying that she was not fired. So you resigned. You weren't fired as, as no. it reported. And, you know, I, I, I like to hear all of these interesting tales, but I have to tell you that they're 100 percent false. And one of the things that I'd ask of those people who are making those assertions, since they assert that I did it so publicly, mm -hmm. is where are the pictures or videos? If I had confronted John Kelly, who is a very formidable person, um, it would garner enough attention for anyone in the room to at least take a picture or a video or something. Yeah, it seems to me that you took pictures and videos like 39 uh, guests of yours were invited to the White House to, uh, you know, for wedding photos. And uh, this was the beginning of the end. Uh, they refused to allow her to post her wedding photos. They said her guests were noisily walking through the uh, Rose Garden and walking through the West Wing and they were just disruptive. And, uh, you know, they talked to her about it. And then they finally told her that she could not post those pictures uh, because she did not get, well, it's unclear whether or not she got official permission uh, to use the People's House, the White House, as a backdrop for her wedding guests. And then it turns out that she had invited the Congressional Black Caucus members to come to the White House in 2016. And uh, she signed the letter, the invitation, which she should be good at because she did do, uh, you know, RSVPs for the Al Gore. So you would think she has this down. She blew that, too. She signed it, the Honorable Omarosa Manigault. And uh, quite frankly, uh, she doesn't deserve that title. She's not um, she she she's uh, the the communications director for the Office of Public Liaison is not entitled to the honorific title. And the people in the Congressional Black Caucus who are entitled to the honorific title, uh, they took uh, offense to that. And then, you know, the wedding shoot was an extended wedding shoot. Uh, and she went to the White House in her bridal attire. And the senior aides were not briefed in advance. They were very irritated by this whole thing. And they were loudly wandering around the Rose Garden and the West. West Wing, and she was banned from posting the pictures online. Uh, they cited security and ethical concerns. Um, and then um, they said that she was, uh, sources told Politico that she had been seen as a p particular problem in the Office of Public Liaison uh, after the, the honorable thing, uh, and that there was this very heated appearance at the National Association of Black Journalists convention in August in New Orleans that uh, prompted a 25-minute screaming match with a broadcast journalist that was moderated by Ed Gordon and um, the African-American community of journalists, the April Ryans of journalists, uh, the other, uh, you know, uh, 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 pundits, uh, the analysts uh, on news uh, shows, all said that they spent 25 minutes debunking the lies she told and then um, when when she when when uh, uh, Ed Gordon was asked how could she sit in the White House uh, while Trump showed support for police brutality because he you remember when Trump did this um, 
I guess it was here in Florida, and he said to the police officers that, you, you know, you need to be rougher. You know, like we put their heads, you know, we cover their heads when we put them in the car. You shouldn't do that. You should be rougher with the, you know, with the criminals, meaning when you're arrested, you're guilty. Do you know what I mean? Um, Manigault said that um, the host of the event of black journalists was being too aggressive. And so she refused to answer the question. And then tension mounted after a 25 minute argument and she walked off stage in a huff. And then uh, Brittany P Packnett, who is a uh, Black Lives Matter activist, stood up and uh, had other people in the audience turn their backs on her to protest her presence. And then yesterday, Robin Roberts, uh, after this uh, Shahan uh, interview, uh, said, you know, well, she said this. She said that uh, she has a profound story to tell. Did you hear this? One of your friends said Armstrong Williams. Mm -hmm. Armstrong Williams told the Washington Post you were unhappy with Trump's handling of Charlottesville and also his endorsement of Roy Moore. Is that um, true? You know, because I am serving until the 20th, I have to be very careful about how I answer this. Why is she serving till the 20th? She was fired. Her White House pass has been um, deactivated. Why is she serving? But there were a lot of things that I observed during the last year that I was very unhappy with, that I was very uncomfortable with, things that I observed, that I such, heard, such that as? I listened to. I can expand upon it because I have to still go back and work with these individuals. But when I have a chance to tell my story, Michael, quite a story to tell. As the only African-American woman in this White House, as a senior staff and assistant to the president, I have seen things that have made me uncomfortable, that have upset me, that have affected me deeply and emotionally, that has affected my community and my people. And when I can tell my story, it is a profound story that I know the world will want to hear. Well, Whoopi Goldberg said this morning that she hopes that uh, Omarosa Manigault finds her people because maybe they're looking for her. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she said, uh, well, she's just been so nasty. You know, I, I hope she finds her people because uh, they may be looking for her. So there's that. And this makes the 10th person in under a year to resign from the White House. 10 people. 10. So there you have that. So extreme an embarrassment to the Trump White House. Wow, how far do you have to go? Now, uh, I want to also uh, draw your attention to uh, what's going on to the in, in the court system because this is just an amazing thing, okay? This is just unbelievable. Uh, the tax bill is likely to pass next week, as you know. Uh, net neutrality passed yesterday, the, the, the undoing of net neutrality, meaning that we aren't all going to get the same delivery on the things that we want. So, um, you know, you have to pay more if you want to be in the fast lane. Uh, perhaps a business like mine will not be allowed at all. Maybe we'll be throttled back. We don't know because uh, just so you know, the way that net neutrality is going to be unveiled to you, when will you start experiencing uh, the fast lane and the slow lane and the throttling back and the blocking uh, completely of certain sites, depending on who your Internet service provider is. If you live like where 50 million Americans live, where you only have one Internet service provider, good luck to you, because they're going to decide what you see what political views you see and hear. They may decide that because they are NBC uh, that you'll see uh, MSNBC. They may decide that because they're associated with Fox that maybe you'll see Fox, but you won't see NBC because they compete with it. You know, you might only see Disney news now. You might only see news, uh, you know, from uh, Snow White uh, and, the, you know, forests. Maybe that's where the reporting will come from. We don't know. But net neutrality, when will you start seeing it? Okay, so here's how it goes. It takes them uh, six weeks to post the decision. Okay, six weeks. And then it's, I want to say, 90 days after that. So you've got, what is this, uh, December, January, February. So in the middle of February, they'll post it. And then March, April, May. So right around May. You'll start seeing uh, changes in your internets. You'll start seeing whether, you know, favorite things of yours just disappear. Or whether they take years to load. For a commercial-free, on-demand, whenever, wherever listening experience, visit randyrhodes.com for your personal premium podcast today. 
Hey everybody, it's Brett from The Randy Road Show, and all I want for Christmas is an impeachment. But the next best thing is working at The Randy Road Show, and that can't happen without your support. Let's help Randy make this a hard truth holiday season, and she can't do that without your support. So please keep listening, and bye, stinking podcast. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders of The Laura Flanders Show. Watch every week on Free Speech TV, Link TV, YouTube, or if you're in New York, CUNY TV. Prefer to listen? Subscribe to the free podcast at lauraflanders.com. I end every week with a commentary. I call it the F word. Here's this week's. The news out of Trump Town comes so fast and furious that it feels to many progressives as if they're being hit on all possible fronts at once. Senate Republicans approve a tax bill that would further pillage the poor one day. The president opens millions of acres of protected federal and indigenous land to drilling the next. The day after that, the White House is recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and scuttling, we're told, the Middle East peace process. It's reckless, the press call it, but that doesn't seem the right word. The Trump GOP seems all about about reckoning and paying their big donors back. It doesn't take a long research project to see how all these moves are connected. In Israel, the White House is in bed with the most far-right racist government in that country's history. They're in bed with the same sort of people in the U.S. In the Americas, their respect for indigenous land and rights and people is virtually non-existent, just as it is in the Middle East. In Israel, Washington plans to spend $38 billion in military aid over the next 10 years, while they simultaneously raid public coffers in the U.S. states. If there's any silver lining to the Trump apocalypse, surely, it's that the veneer of a social contract has been blown up. Government by the people, for the people, it's as dead as that Middle East peace process, which, by the way, Trump didn't destroy because it didn't exist. As far as the Palestinians are concerned, there's no peace process and there'll be no peace. Trade unions, political parties, NGOs, and refugee groups, essentially all of Palestinian civil society, called for a general strike in response to the White House announcement. In the U.S., the penny still has to drop. It's not recklessness on myriad fronts. It's all one front. It's all one wreck. You can watch this week's report on how activists in the South are coming together in the U.S. to build shared power this week on The Laura Flanders Show, on Link TV, Free Speech TV, CUNY TV, or on our own YouTube channel. Find out more at lauraflanders.com. And thanks. All things Randy at RandyRoads.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Net neutrality rules classify high-speed internet as a public utility. The goal is to ensure consumers have open and equal access to all content on the internet. Here's how it works. When you download content from the internet, it arrives in packets of data. Think of the packets as literal packages. Let's say you want to watch a Netflix movie, which is 10 packages big. First you order, but before Netflix ships, those packages have to go through a sorting facility. In this analogy, that's an internet service provider, like Verizon or Comcast. Now what net neutrality means is that all packages must be delivered at the same rate. And currently, there are FCC rules in place to make sure that happens. And uh, they just overturned those rules. So I don't know. Are, they, are we going to start seeing new computers with coin slots in them? I'm not sure. I mean, it, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just a... It's a so uh, the internet is going to be slower and more expensive. Which fits in with most of our infrastructure. I mean, why should why should the information superhighway... Uh, be the only highway in America that isn't crumbling, right? Right. Right. Good luck to me. Good luck to me. You know, and of course, uh, the public comments to the FCC were rife with fake, hijacked email addresses. Because why should comments to the FCC be any more secure than our elections? 500,000, half a million of the comments came from Russian addresses. Russian addresses addresses you know all i can say is i hope that the increases in your internet costs will be covered by the 
huge raises you're going to get from cutting corporate tax rates. You know, you're going to get huge raises when we cut. So, you know, uh, this tax bill is going to more than pay for your health care and your Internet fees going up. Right. I feel good about it. Don't you No. So uh, here's how it goes. So Congress uh, can intervene. Yes. Uh, and also the attorneys general across the country are filing lawsuits as we speak. Uh, New York, Eric Schneiderman is uh, filing a lawsuit and he's joined by Oregon, Illinois, Iowa, Massachusetts, California. California wants to pass a state law that says that uh, net neutrality is the rules, is the law of California. Uh, I hope that works. But, you know, uh, the, the, the reason that you have to realize that two million of these uh, comments were fake and that some of them were, you know, written over the signatures of forged, uh, uh, you know, uh, forged uh, names and some of them were dead and some of them were uh, taken off, uh, you know, the Internet and uh, they didn't sign, you know, they weren't the right people. And then a half a million of them were Russian uh, people or Russian email addresses. And so uh, because of the... Um, forgeries and uh, that's a crime to steal somebody's identity this is what gives the entree into the court so you now have 19 attorneys generals who are calling on the fcc to delay the 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 um implementation of net neutrality they are suing there's no uh there's no question that there will be live lawsuits about this but here's how it goes it takes uh it takes effect 60 days after publication in the federal register so they say it's going to take them about 60 days to post it to the Federal Register as an official rule. And then uh, it takes about, after publication, it takes about 60, day, uh, 60 days. What did I say? 90? 60 days. I was wrong. So figure six weeks is a month and a half, and then 60 days is another two months. This is December, January, February, uh, March. Yeah, about March, April, you, you'll start seeing, uh, you know, the the effects of it unless these attorneys general who can get into court which will bring us to our next subject who can get into court in a civil court case although it's partly criminal too i mean the forged the forged signatures make it criminal so uh, who knows which venue they'll they'll end up in uh, but they the 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 implementation of it could be stayed by a court pending a decision and then expect it to go whatever happens on appeal, you know, another couple of years. You know, we don't know. We don't know. So everybody is waiting to see, uh, you know, what, what it actually does. But I know a letter was filed that included uh, 18, 19 attorneys general from Virginia, Delaware, Hawaii, California, Oregon, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Rhode Island, Washington, Vermont, the District of Columbia, uh, you know, uh, people like Facebook and Twitter who are not ser uh, I Internet service providers, meaning they don't own the pipes. OK, they own the content of Facebook. They own uh, the mechanism to disseminate the Twitters, but they don't own the pipes. The pipes are owned by your ISP, your Internet service provider, which could be Comcast. It could be Adelphia. You know, I don't even know, you know, what or Verizon, right? Like this. And those are the interested parties who want to get rid of the rules where the Facebook and the YouTubes and the Twitters don't want to slow down the internet. In fact, there are stories out today in like tech magazines, TechCrunch, Gizmodo, I, I was looking all over the tech magazines this morning, who are all freaked out because they think people like me who are content providers on YouTube, we're, we're, we're gonna have to pay more to even be on YouTube to make up for the difference that YouTube spends on uh, having their websites uh, you know, deliver uh, at a good speed. And the people who download or look at the YouTubes are going to be charged per view of whatever you watch on the YouTubes. And so it's going to kill content providers. Also, Etsy, which is a uh, you know small entrepreneurial website, they're, they're freaking out about this because they're, they're not deep pockets. And they're, they're worried that the cost of uh, you know, even just posting that website and having it in the fast lane so that when you do your transaction, it goes through quickly. Because we all know seconds make the difference on the Internet. Split seconds make the difference on the Internet. If my website is loading slowly, meaning it takes a whole second for it to appear on your screen, I get complaints. So Slowing down my website isn't going to work for us at all. 
Um, but uh, yes, prices will go up and variety and diversity will go down. And uh, only the largest, best capitalized internet companies, uh, you know, will uh, be able to get their, le- you know, they'll have an advantage, just like this corporate tax cut gives an advantage to big business over small business. This is all to wipe out entrepreneurship in the United States of America. Fast lanes, slow lanes, you know, your your favorite websites might load more slowly, like for instance, mine or Etsy is a, is a great one. <clears throat> the t-shirt of choice now is a t-shirt that has FCC on it and it says FCK. FCK, the FCC. That's the, the, and if you go to buy that t-shirt, it might load slowly, you know, after uh, net neutrality rules are. So uh, it's just, you, you're no longer going to be the one in control of what you want to see. Now, right now, here's, here's the thing I could tell you. Right now, you have access to anything, as you know. You go on the internet, you could Google anything. Anything at all, diseases, you know, uh, you, um, you know, uh, uh, weird, where did this expression, you know, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, where did that come? You know, you can look up anything, anything you want. And of course, the internet is going to go from anything you want to what Comcast, AT&T, and Verizon pick and choose. That's a big change, being able to Google. Oh, and it might not even be Google. It might not even be Google. I mean, if, if, if let's say, uh, Verizon wants to use Bing, which, you know, uh, maybe you won't even have access to uh, Google searches anymore. You'll have to use the Bing search engine. It just depends, you know, because uh, uh, Verizon uh, and, and all online retailers, you know, uh, if you want to be in the fast lane of the Internet, maybe you'll have to pay for their premium package. Now, Amazon and eBay can afford to do this, but sites like Etsy uh, can't or independent people like me or uh, Herky Jerky or, uh, you know, any of our av- Tempest Tile, you know, any of our advertisers, they may not be able to afford afford to be in the fast line and that will kill uh, their sales because if it takes more than a split second to download their website you're going someplace else and that's just the way it is so uh, the, the CEO the former CEO of Etsy Chad Dickerson he was the main guy that led for the, uh, the net neutrality rules. He was fighting for net neutrality to be enshrined as government policy back in 2015 and because he was showing uh, that fractions of a second made all the difference to uh, the viability of these independent sellers on Etsy. You know, Etsy makes like, a, you know, uh, it's an independent seller website where if you make handmade items like this necklace that I'm wearing. Uh, I think the the woman who made it is called Cowboy Princess, and she sent it to me. It's just a little uh, a piece of steel, and she engraves them. And so she engraved, uh, she sent this to me uh, as a gift. Uh, and it says on it, turn up your mind, which is uh, this show, one of the show's slogans, and sent it to me, and she, she's a seller on Etsy. You know, this poor girl... Uh, how is she going to compete with Amazon if uh, her st- uh, if Etsy doesn't even load anymore? Do you know what I'm saying? So you have incumbent companies with a huge advantage, and it gets worse. It does get worse. Remember that the new rules or lack of rules uh, whatsoever and the inability to complain anymore about anything that's being blocked on the Internet for you – uh, and the, I, the idea that, you know, uh, Comcast, Verizon, whatever, they're going to be able to charge more for different tiers of access. They will also now be free to block access to whatever part of the Internet they feel serves their financial interests. So, for instance, AT&T could make a deal with Microsoft and make Bing the search engine and block Google entirely if you have AT&T as your internet service provider, Comcast, who's my internet service provider, as you know, they may decide that they want to grow um, their own streaming services. And so they may block all access to Netflix. Verizon could decide that Fox News is more in line with its corporate interests than CNN or the New York Times. And they could block access to CNN's website. They can block access to the New York Times, even though you're paying a subscription fee to the New York Times, which I do in the Wall Street Journal as well. But they can decide that Fox News is a better fit for their company's interests, and they can completely block CNN. They can completely block uh, any other news outlet that they don't feel, uh, you know, jibe. And so you could be uh, with AT&T or Verizon or whatever – 
and not have access to journalism and only have access to fake news. So for now, it's the end of the internet as we know it. But a legal effort to overturn this decision is uh, has already begun. It, it, it started immediately. And uh, that's that's where we are. And this is this is freaking me out. I got to tell you, because, you know, we built a nice little business here. Of course, you could build it better. Support the show, Support the show by a stinking podcast. Uh, but it could all be undone in, in, in an instant because we could get blocked by Comcast. Maybe Comcast decides that, you know, our brand of politics doesn't serve their uh, interests. And then they could, they could actually, you know, start having to answer questions about why are they allowing certain voices, just like the radio, just like the radio companies. Oh, it's unbelievable. But of course, they will favor their own properties over competitors properties so that's that's the dangerous part so let's say like i said netflix might not be available to you and i and i'm using that as the the great example because everybody loves netflix everybody loves it and that's where we are now the courts we're in the courts right they were in the courts because we think and everybody with a, a a right mind thinks that a free and open Information superhighway benefits all Americans. It benefits students. It benefits people who are trying to. What if healthcare.gov? I used this yesterday as an example. Today's the last day, by the way, to sign up for uh, healthcare. At healthcare.gov. Did you do it, Brett? All right. <laughs> Brett did it. I did it months ago. But um, today is the last day to sign up for Obamacare. And uh, let's say Trump really hates Obamacare. Let's just imagine that somebody would hate access to health insurance with a subsidy provided to you in case you don't have a, a, an enormous amount of income. And he just decides to slow down government websites like healthcare.gov. Let's say he decides to slow down the website of FEMA where you're applying for your water damage claim or your wind damage claim or your replacement claim for you know everything you lost in the hurricanes over the summer. Let's say he wants to slow down the, uh, the, 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 the filing of claims. All they have to do is put FEMA in the slow lane. Yeah. And of course, uh, there are places you can look to to see what it looks like. Portugal, the UK, by the way, Internet providers in Portugal and, and, and England do not have net neutrality rules. And so they charge extra fees for social messaging, for watching YouTubes. Oh, yeah. If you're in England, you've got to buy a package that will allow you to watch X amount of YouTube videos per month or allow you to use uh, social messaging on Facebook or even access Facebook. And of course, in China, which we're becoming more like every single day, um, if you want to see what the future of net neutrality looks like, you, you have to understand what web browsing in Beijing is like. OK, now, the Communist Party in China uh, is, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they have rules for the telecom giants. And uh, so people, uh, you know, the telecom giants have to agree to filter the news and information that goes to the Chinese people in order to even operate in China. Facebook was considering doing that, was considering self-censoring uh, in order to get access to the Chinese marketplace because they don't have Facebook in China right now. But Facebook wants access. And Zuckerberg was talking about compromises he might make in order to get into a billion people's lives in China. And so he was willing to, uh, you know, tamp down free speech on the Facebook Beijing version. He would sell out freedom of speech to have access for a billion people. So you can see where even your friendly websites that you've grown accustomed to that seem like they're on your side might just agree to censorship in order to continue to uh, be in the fast lane. But China has something called China's Great Firewall. And some sites load with what they call soul withering slowness. Other sites won't load at all. No one really knows in China why that is. Uh, they could be told, it's your router, it's the Wi-Fi, oh, there's a power failure, oh, it's commercial sabotage, all to clamp down on political dissent. And the Chinese people have no idea, and they can't go to court to argue it, but uh, everything you do on the Internet in China is surveilled by the government. 
clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes Air Force. Air, Air, Air Force. RandyRhodes.com. Hi, this is Scotty, Randy's producer here to remind you it's December, a month that's known for its holidays. You got your Christmas, your Hanukkah, your Kwanzaa, your Boxing Day, Festivus. No matter what holiday you celebrate, it's a time we all come together with our families and friends. And since you're all my family and friends, I like to wish each and every one of you a happy slash merry holidays of your choice. Now, if you're still looking for the perfect gift, I, Scotty, got you covered. Go to randyroads.com. And buy your friends or family a stinking podcast. Think about it. What better way to show your loved ones that you really care than sharing with them the knowledge of truth and facts? And if you can't stand the people in your life, but you still want to do something great for the holidays, here's an idea for you. Support the show. By supporting The Randy Road Show, you help keep us going into the new year. And if 2017 was a sign of things to come, we'll need Randy more than ever. Go to randyroads.com to buy a stinking podcast and or support the show. Happy holidays, jerky fans. Herky Jerky knows it's the season to enjoy the world's best jerky and meat sticks, and they want you to save a bundle while doing it. Herky Jerky, first of all, would like to thank you all, all you fiercely loyal customers, because they had their most successful year thanks to you, despite Mother Nature doing its worst. Jason at Herky Jerky is so grateful that you enjoy his products, and everyone at Herky Jerky is so glad to provide them. So, as a special thank you, Herky Jerky is serving up their best offer of the year for Christmas giving. $10 $10 off any order of 60 or more or $15 off any order $100 or more without a promo code. Just visit HerkyJerky.com. And the now famous bacon jerky, new fat-free and delicious turkey jerky, and all four of the new nitrite and preservative-free flavors plus good old beef jerky and all the exotic game jerkies make perfect holiday gifts. Buffalo, elk, venison sticks, three different varieties of beef smokies all make great stocking stuffers. So choose your favorites now. Take advantage of the savings, which also includes free shipping on any two packs or more. Everyone at Herky Jerky would like to wish a safe and happy holiday season to all of you, and thank you once again for your loyalty. This offer starts today, and it goes through all of December. Happy holidays from HerkyJerky.com. Whether you're listening to me, Mark Levine, each Monday and Wednesday, or me, Leslie Marshall, each Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, you can hear us 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Voices Network. Here's a sample of what you'll hear. Donald Trump's National Security Advisor, uh, Michael Flynn, who uh, resigned in disgrace, has flipped on him. Now, for those of us who've been watching the Russia investigation, none of this is a surprise. Obviously, Trump and his team were colluding with Russia. Obviously, it was a conspiracy to commit espionage, commit treason, to change the election, and in return to give Russia what it wanted, basically, to allow the United States to allow it to commit all human rights abuses. This isn't even news. Uh, We're going to find out the details of it. It will come. And yes, I think we're at IMP on the impeachment scale. Again, that's Mark Levine every Monday and Wednesday. And Leslie Marshall each Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Voices Network. The Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Today, the Republican-led FCC voted to dismantle the free and open Internet by repealing former President Obama's net neutrality rules, which were designed to ensure that all web traffic is treated equally and prevent service providers from blocking or filtering content they don't want you to see. The FCC is led by Ajit Pai, who is best known for both his opposition to net neutrality and for the size of his coffee mug. Greetings, Chairman Pai, Mindy Hill with the DCVoice.com. Um, and I just have a comment. Uh, during the Obama administration, the FCC had no jurisdiction oh over my God. Uh, regulating programming. I'm sorry, but you can't just drink from a mug that size without any explanation. Was the mug always that big, or did you shrink? Are you sharing an office with Rick Moranis? <laughs> Is that why you want to limit the internet so people can't go online and make memes about you and your giant coffee mug? 
Now, polls show that Americans overwhelmingly support net neutrality, with 83 percent overall in favor of keeping the FCC rules, including 75 percent of Republicans. And it makes sense Republicans would favor an open Internet. Otherwise, they'd have to get their news from newspapers or CNN instead of Facebook group Patriot Eagle MAGA 1776. <laughs> Net neutrality ensures an open and democratic internet where people can make and access content equally. But Pi has argued that limiting regulation of the internet would actually encourage companies to innovate more. And he keeps using one phrase in particular. Until 2015, we had light touch regulation. The consumer was best served with light touch regulation. It's under that light touch framework. Light touch regulation, light touch regulation, and that's the kind of success that we want to promote in the future with light touch regulation. Please stop using the term light touch. <laughs> you sound like someone defending themselves to HR. What did Deborah say I did? That was a light touch. You were there. It was light. <laughs> All right. Deborah in Seattle. Hi. Hi, Randy. Hi. Um, I was going to tell you, you're all, I like your cold shoulder tops, and that one looks nice. Um, what are you watching? Oh, I'm not wearing a cold shoulder top. I'm wearing my Randy Rhodes. Air Force T-shirt. Oh, I'm sorry. I was an old one. I'm sorry. You're right. Because yeah. I see the date. Duh. Okay. Anyway, um, I just wanted to talk, first of all, about, you know, like the whole Alabama thing where the, the black people came out. And the biggest thing that makes me feel good, because we're always talked about, because I'm a black woman, uh, that we don't stick together. And so that did show that we do actually stick together. So that was one of the first things. And it was actually kind of beautiful to see that uh, the more dude was not going to get in there because it was a little creepy and scary for a minute. So I wasn't sure how that was going to go. Well, I, um, I, yesterday's order was to thank a black woman. So thank you, Deborah. Okay. And then um, the whole net neutrality thing. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm understanding that now the... I guess the ISPs or whatever, so they can just slow us down and block any and everything. So, yes. like, if I wanted to go to your website, they could block it. Yes. If okay, so I mean, does that mean they're just going to make us pay higher prices, or so we can get? Well, to they're going to make or? both of us. They're going to make me pay a higher price if they accept us in the fast lane. OK, uh, then we have to pay a higher price to be in the fast lane. And God only knows what that price will be, because right now our cable bill just, you know, to do this show is about six hundred fifty five dollars a month. Uh, that's enormous. So uh, maybe right. it'll be, you know, twelve hundred dollars a month. And if we can afford that, then maybe we'll be allowed to uh, apply to be in the fast mm -hmm. line. But if they decide that our brand of politics isn't consistent with their business practices or they find something that we say offensive or they, you know, they don't like that I uh, advocate for. Uh, you know, um, qualified judges, then they can they can say, well, you can't get on uh, the fa you can't get in the fast lane for any price. OK, let's say they say you can for the, for a price. I pay the price. Now you on your end, your cable provider can also block our website unless you pay an additional fee to have access to. Uh, let's say you're on AT&T and I'm on Comcast. Well, maybe AT&T blocks Comcast and all the content. Okay. So now you're going to have to pay a fee to get whatever it is that you want that's being disseminated on Comcast. So everybody's going to pay more for every part of it. So now, what were you talking about earlier, though, when you said um, maybe we'll have a win? Are you talking about once um, we get the, the guy from Alabama into the house or... What guy no, from maybe. Alabama into the house? There's I'm no sorry. guy from Alabama going to the house. Or, or, or I know. I know. I, I'm sorry. I think I'm you're just... listening to yesterday's show and commenting on it today. And therein lies your dilemma. Yeah, you're right. I was listening to that, but I did switch over to the new one, too. So I'm sorry. Yeah. But I just, I, I, you know, I keep hearing a lot of things of how we can overturn this. So I guess my question to you is how. Could we overturn it? There are I many mean, ways. A... First of all, the FCC is just an agency, and it could be overturned by a, a law that Congress could make to uh, uh, say that net neutrality is the law of the land, meaning it's a uh, free and open Internet and no Internet provider can block content that they don't want. Everybody has access to everything, all at the same speed, period, end of story. 
Uh, so the, Congress can intervene and they can pass a law. The other way is the courts can overturn this as being a, 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 an abomination to free speech or any other equal access or, you know, there's many things in the Constitution um, that uh, would apply here. Antitrust regulations, free speech, uh, you know, constitutional uh, issues, uh, uh, equal protection under law for all content providers. There's a lot that can be done. So it's either going to be congressional or it'll come from the courts. Yeah, well, I guess I if congressional. I'm not going to hold my breath on that, um, even the courts. But anyway, I just wanted to uh, let you know that it would be wonderful, too, if you guys could do like back in the day when you used to travel around to different select cities, like you, Tom Hartman, and Stephanie Miller, and so on and so forth, you know, and and visit us and kind of, you know, of course, charge. But I'm just saying, you know, I know you guys used to do that in the past. Yeah, but we know we never we don't. Well, I don't know about uh, other shows, but I work for a corporation, so I never got any of that money. But they did put me on a plane. So. Oh, OK. Yeah. All right. She's listening to old shows. Uh, Deborah in Richmond, Virginia. Maybe this Deborah will be uh, with today's show. Uh, this is Dave. This is David and Madison. Oh, David and Madison. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I just called to see why don't you play the bouncy boobies anymore? Because uh, I'm tired of it. Oh, I, that's what, that's not the way I look for. Uh, Deborah in Richmond, Virginia. Hey, Randy. Hi. So, um, been observing and just taking things in for a minute, and um, just was was um thinking. Um, so my theory is Russia, um, is working alongside um. Uh, North Korea, and of course, I do believe uh, the con man is a part of it too, some some way somehow. In that this here North Korea thing, they've been back in North Korea secretly, um, and now they want to come to the table. At some point, they're going to try to get to the table as negotiators um, when they are at the twelfth hour of bombs being dropped, so that sanctions can be lifted as a part of what they get out of the deal for bringing in an end to the. Um, Extortion. It's going to be like this. Is, this. is this what it's going to be today? All right. <laughs> Ellen in, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> Ellen? Oh, Hi, Ellen. Hi. Hi, Randy. Hi, Ellen. What I actually wanted to talk to you about was um, I feel like there's no freedom of speech anymore. And I, I, I think if they go through with this net neutrality, how can they do this? Because against the First Amendment. Yeah, I know. It does. And then the other thing I was going to talk to you about, which is sort of a little bit off the subject, was that I just watched Adam Schiff yeah. on MSNBC. And what really upsets me is that he was talking about the Mueller investigation and that no more witnesses are going to be called for January. And he is really concerned as well that Trump and the recovery Republicans seem to be moving towards shutting down this investigation. And I started to cry. Yeah. What are we going to do? Well, it's just, it, you know, listen, here's the thing. Uh, the Republicans have always, uh, you know, uh, been angling to shut down the House investigation and the Senate investigation. And so they're trying to do that. And then Trump will point to the shutdown of the House and Senate as a victory and then say Mueller needs to be shut down, too. And he hopes to do that without aggravating, uh, you know, uh, the House, which would impeach him right now if he fired Mueller, even though they're Republicans and, uh, you know, without creating some constitutional crisis. But uh, so he's going after the congressional uh, investigations first. That's pretty much what's going on. And so do you think that we're going to have an investigation? Yes. When it comes to I, I, the president cannot fire Bob Mueller without uh, causing a major, major upheaval in Congress. I mean, even the Republicans will say that's a bridge too far. So because, you know, listen, uh, the, the reason why, you know, you read the, I don't know if how many people read this story. It was like 25 pages yesterday in The New York Times. But the story in The New York Times yesterday was that Trump does not allow the presidential daily briefings to include anything about uh, the Russia in, in interference in this election or the hacking or, you know, things that, uh, you know, the intelligence community is advising that we do to protect our elections in 2018 and going forward. Right. 
So what's really interesting is that since, uh, you know, they know what the reality is, they are not allowed to talk to Trump about it, but they are already writing memos, you know, and they're already uh, taking uh, p- policy positions in, uh, you know, the National Security Council, in the National Security Agency, at the CIA, at the FBI, at the NSA, to uh, protect our elections without the president going along with it because the president won't allow anybody to tell him. So if he fired Mueller, those same intelligence people, the CIA, the NSA, the NSC, all these intelligence people would run to Congress screaming bloody murder and cause a major, major, major constitutional crisis for Donald Trump. So while the congressional committees have not really done such a fabulous job on, uh, you know, the investigations because you got the Devin Nunes in the House overriding everything Adam Schiff would like to subpoena or do. And in the Senate, uh, you know, you've got a lot of opposition uh, on the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Senate Judiciary Committee. You know, they're, they're, they still cannot fire Mueller. He's an independent investigator and he has subpoena power where Adam Schiff has to ask for a subpoena. He has to ask Devin Nunes and, uh, you know, Devin Nunes just says no. So the congressional committees aren't going to be as effective. They're not able to issue a subpoena to the banks. They're not able to issue a subpoena to Deutsche Bank. They're not able to call in witnesses that they want to call in. They're not able to do half of what they need to be doing. Um, so that's his frustration, Adam Schiff's frustration. That's what you heard. But it has nothing to do with Mueller. Mueller's investigation will continue and it will go to its natural conclusion and that's just a fact uh bruce in switzerland hey randy i'm so happy that you have time for me oh, it's like five o'clock in the morning there what are you doing what you you're no it's uh three till eleven in the evening oh that's it yeah you, you're looking around the other side of the globe go the other way look there are a couple of topics here and it's not just geocentric USA. I'm an American here in Switzerland. We face the same kind of uh, challenges with free speech, with broadcasting, consolidation, and, um, you know, the Internet freedom, and et cetera. I know. That's why I brought up Europe. I brought up England. I brought up Portugal. I brought up uh, the other side of the world, Beijing. You know, everybody is fighting to have access to a free and open Internet all over the globe. What's beautiful is that we have that here. And now we're going to become more like the countries that are struggling uh, than the country that we are today. Yeah. Okay, but there's more consolidation. We can't fight that. That's beyond our help. We can't do anything about that. What can we do, Randy? That's what I ask you. Okay, we can do things about consolidation. There are antitrust laws, but you need a real court to hear these cases. Trump is very busy packing these courts with very young, very stupid, very federalist, very uh, rabid. I I can't even believe it. That's why I'm a refugee here in the Alps, because I couldn't take it anymore back there. Yeah, I used to work with you at WIOD back there in uh, the wonderful Isle of Dreams. What did you do? Were you a news guy? Yeah, I worked at WIOD and WNUS. and uh, You worked but, with you know, me? No, we were, um, we could say, contemporaries. Ah, I see. At the same time there. Mm-hmm. I understand. Uh, well, but I, anyway. Okay, look, so what can we do? So What look, can we do? That's okay, what I want to know. Like Not I just said, locally, but uh, worldwide. Right. Well, you can't do it worldwide. Every country is going to have its own rules about the Internet. Beijing is so going to have the, the, their, their firewall. And if you're having a tough time in Switzerland, uh, then I don't know what your antitrust regulations are or if you have any. You know, this is all uh, country to country. Like I said, England, they pay extra fees for social messaging. They pay extra fees to watch YouTube. This is where we're going. Beijing, of course, they just, you know, slow down websites that they find inconvenient to the Communist Party or they just block them completely. Chinese platforms are all heavily government surveilled and censorship is done by the party and the corporate apparatchiks in China. And if, like I said, Facebook might play that game in China, self-censorship in order to get cleared to launch in China. It's a country to country thing. We have a Congress and we have courts. 
Those are the two places we're going to look to. The courts are looking like crap. To speak to Randy, call now, you bastards. 561-270-3844. Hello, hello. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Air Force. Now, the top of the hour on the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn presents the Green News Report. We found thousands of farm workers out in the fields of Ventura County without the, the protective mask that they need. Officials warn of toxic smoke from Southern California wildfires. The Arctic as a whole is warming at least twice as fast as the rest of the planet. New bad news for the melting Arctic. At Global Summit, the world fights climate change without the U.S., Plus, please come to France. French president makes good on promise to fund U.S. climate scientists. All of those stories and more straight ahead. From Bradblog.com, I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. Coal, the science is in, and it's coal. (laughs) And that's all it is. And this is your Green News Report. Okay, Desi Doyen, it is damn near Christmas, and we are still fighting wildfires out here in Southern California. Winter wildfires, which is really weird. But yes, the wildfires still rage in Southern California, and now state officials are warning of hazardous air quality in some areas, telling residents to stay inside to avoid exposure to toxic smoke and carcinogenic ash from incinerated homes. But labor activists warn that thousands of farm workers are still working outside in the dangerous smoke and have not received protective equipment from their employers. That's according to Lucas. Zucker of the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy in an interview with Democracy Now! We've found thousands of farm workers out in the fields of Ventura County without the, the protective masks that they need. You know, workers are really faced with this, this horrific choice of, of either giving up the income they desperately need in a time like this or, or be out in conditions that are endangering their, their health and safety. And for people who don't know the area out here in Southern California, there are farms, orchards, a vast agricultural area. They call this part of Southern California the salad bowl because it produces so much of the food for the rest of the country and i can only imagine what it's like out there working in those fields right next to these fires which are hundreds of miles wide disturbing news for the arctic the national oceanic and atmospheric administration reports that this year clocked in as the second warmest year on record for the arctic with the smallest extent of sea ice ever on record NOAA arctic director jeremy mathis warned that the rate and magnitude of sea ice loss since 2000 is unprecedented in at least 1500 years studies have increasingly linked the melting Arctic to changing weather patterns and extreme weather events in the Northern Hemisphere. At the One Planet Summit in Paris this week, we're in the process of losing the battle. French President Emmanuel Macron called on European leaders and corporations to pick up the pace of action in cutting emissions that cause dangerous global warming. Macron also made good on an earlier promise, announcing multi-million dollar grants to 13 U.S. climate scientists to conduct their research in France after U.S. President Donald Trump, who was not invited to the conference, vowed he would withdraw the U.S. from the historic U.N. Paris Climate Agreement in 2020. So we're not funding these scientists anymore. France has to step in and fund U.S. climate science. (laughs) That's right. Unbelievable. But American political and business leaders were also there in Paris to organize and to help developing countries prepare for climate impacts. Former California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger offered some blunt reassurance. It doesn't matter that Donald Trump backed out of the Paris Agreement because the private sector didn't drop out, the public sector didn't drop out, universities didn't drop out, scientists didn't drop out, engineers didn't drop out, no one dropped out. Donald Trump pulled 
Donald Trump out of the Paris Agreement. Among several major announcements at the summit, the World Bank and global insurer AXA said they will end all financing for oil and gas exploration starting in 2019. Major investors launched a campaign to pressure the world's top 100 greenhouse gas emitting corporations to reduce their emissions. And China's environment minister announced China is on the cusp of launching its nationwide carbon emissions trading market, which would be the largest in the world. Finally, the U.S. private sector is stepping up its investment in clean energy technology at home. Tesla Motors' new all-electric semi-truck was unveiled just last month, but it's already pulling in hundreds of pre-orders from major corporations. The latest from beverage giant Pepsi, which this week ordered 100 Tesla all-electric semis, citing its lower overall cost compared to conventional internal combustion semis. Give it up, Desi Doyen. Elon Musk is not going to give you a free Model 3. Oh, come on. For much more on all of those stories and the ones we couldn't get to today, please check out our website at greennews.bradblog.com. Don't forget, you can download our reports anytime via Stitcher, TuneIn, or iTunes. Find us and follow us worldwide on the Facebooks and the Twitters, even in France, at Green News Report. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyle. And this has been your Green News Report. Please help progressive voices support the Green News Report by stopping by bradblog.com slash donate. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream today. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey! It's a segment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. This is going to be one of the great gifts to the middle-income people of this country that they've ever gotten for Christmas. The tax bill just landed on Friday, so a lot of people don't even know what's in it. Maybe you can help us. Yeah. What percentage of this tax cut is going to people who make, say, around two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year? Well, this is really historic. I mean, this is the biggest single change to the tax system in fixing a broken tax code that we've ever had. What's the answer? A family of four making $75,000 will get about a $2,000 tax cut, and a family of four making $150,000 will get almost $4,000. Plus, we think as a result of lowering business taxes, wages will go up. So this is a huge opportunity for creating jobs, creating tax cuts, for working families. But do you have any idea what percentage is going to people <laughs> who make less than 250000 less than $200,000 a year? I do. Because I understand that there's a huge tax cut going to corporate America, and I understand that every tax, tax bracket is getting a tax cut. But what percentage is going to the middle-income people that President Trump keeps talking about? Jake, the, the numbers are very complicated, and different people will present it different ways. I can't take him. I there's something about his affect, you know, the way his uh, you know facial features don't change when he lies like that. I mean, he has you know if he's talking, that's his tell that he's lying. Uh, but it's 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 unbelievable. First of all, we have to say, oh Atlanta, oh Seattle Tacoma, oh Olympia, oh oh oh. So uh, just so you know, last night uh, there was some, all day yesterday there were thousands of flights canceled because. We had some sort of infrastructure failure at uh, Atlanta Hartsfield Airport, the hub for Delta. Thousands and thousands of flights uh, canceled. Uh, They said it was some underground fire. We don't know. And then we woke up this morning to find that there was um, this massive train derailment uh, in the uh, Olympia, Washington area over one of the busiest highways known to man, where we're deciding to run high-speed rail over... Old tracks, yeah, old tracks for slow speed rail. We're now using those and refurbishing those for high speed rail. And uh, it looks like 83 people were on that train uh, this morning during the rush hour. 
And 77 of those 83 have been taken to the hospital with injuries. There were 14 cars, 13 of them derailed. And uh, now the latest is several dead. Expect that to uh, increase as the day goes on. Now they're telling us that this, uh, you know, this technology that we have called positive train control. I don't know. I'm becoming an expert in trains now. Uh, It's some advanced system that is used to stop a train before certain accidents occur. Uh, On this particular ride, which was the very first inaugural ride on this high-speed train that was refurbished, that was using refurbished slow-speed rail tracks, okay, um, that on the inaugural ride today, that the positive train control advanced system was not on. I don't know. Now, I will tell you here at the uh, Conspiracy-Minded Randy Roadshow, not we are all thinking the same thing. I mean, you know, you shut down an airport and then you derail uh, 14 cars of an Amtrak train. It just seems fishy to me. It just does. It just seems uh, a little creepy. We'll wait. We'll wait while Alex Jones will not and uh, Roger Stone will appear saying he was poisoned by polonium. We will wait to see what the uh, official reports are. But you know what? You can't trust your government any longer because they're doing things like banning words from the Centers for Disease Control. I I swear to God, this is this is a sick story. But first, we want to do the taxes. Okay, we want to do the taxes because this bill fell out on Friday. And, uh, you know, Bob Corker has admitted that he hasn't read the bill yet. But apparently he has talked to his accountant. And so his lack of knowledge about what's in the bill is made up for by the amount of uh, riches that will flow his way, according to his accountant. So now he's a yes. Uh, If you were if you thought that jellyfish Rubio was going to be the one that uh, would sink the tax plan for the GOP. Here's the most important number when thinking of Rubio. 2020. Right. So no way. You know, he said that if it, it was if you didn't get a two thousand dollar child tax credit refundable to you, even if you didn't make enough money to pay taxes, uh, that he would be a no. Well, he you know, right now you get eleven hundred dollars refundable. It went all the way up, all the way up to a big whopping one thousand four hundred dollars refundable. So he's a yes. Wow. I'm impressed. He's a yes. Then Steve Mnuchin was on, uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, meet the press thing now where he says, uh, you know, we think corporate tax rate, lowering corporate tax rates is somehow going to, uh, you know, create jobs. And so uh, that's why we named it the tax cut and job creation tax bill. Um, Nobody agrees with him. Not any economist from across the great divide. Nobody agrees that, you know, uh, businesses are going to create more jobs. Everybody agrees that businesses are sitting on trillions of dollars in profits they had some of their best years ever in the last nine they have not created more jobs because they're at full employment and they don't need more jobs unless we see more consumer demand the way to get consumer demand is to put more money into your pocket and these piddly little chunks of coal that you will get out of this tax bill which at the same time is going to add 1.46 trillion dollars to the deficit is a pittance so the Republicans are, uh, you know, you, you heard over the weekend, I, I hope that uh, John McCain is very, very frail and that uh, he has gone back to Arizona and he is not coming back to Washington to vote at least on this tax bill. And now they plan to wheel in Thad Cochran from Mississippi. Oh, yeah, they're going to wheel in Thad Cochran, who appeared disoriented in his last Senate appearance and had to be told how to vote because he's so out of it. Uh, And that's pretty much the GOP these days, you know, Uh, old, disoriented, and simply doing what they're told to do by their donors. In fact, uh, you know, I think it was Marco Rubio who shared, or or one of the senators shared with the paper, you know, the Washington Post or the New York Times or one of the major papers over the weekend that they are getting phone calls from their donors who said to them, Don't expect another nickel out of us unless you pass this tax bill. The donors want it. No one else wants it. The donors want it. So while Mnuchin would not answer the question, what percentage of the benefits will be going to the top 5% or the top 1%, the answer to the question is the top 5% gets 72% of the benefits. 
the top 1% will get 60% of the benefits. For example, the estate tax, which used to come into play, if you chose as a couple to gift your children, meaning that their money, their wealth would come as an inheritance, right? They're very much alive. They've got their whole lives ahead of them, but you want to make sure they never have to work. So now, you know, uh, currently under current law, you can, as a couple, gift your children $11 million without any tax. They don't have to pay a nickel. They can just take this money, $11 million. Now, you should only live so long that you make $11 million. But if you made $11 million, you'd be taxed at 39% right now. If, you, if, if your work created an $11 million payday for you, you'd be taxed at 39%. Yet, if you're a ne'er-do-well, you know, a, a, a lucky sperm winner... You can inherit $11 million and owe no tax to the government. Well, that just went up to $22 million. You can literally inherit $22 million and you will only pay zero. You will pay zero. Okay, here's uh, Bernie who was on Face the Nation trying to lay out what Steve Mnuchin would not. And of course, he heard Steve Mnuchin earlier in the day. Well, I think we did everything uh, that we could. Uh, But at the end of the day, what you had is people like Mr. Mnuchin, who himself is worth three or four hundred million dollars. Oh, my God. Hello, three or four hundred million. Oh, that's right. He's the Goldman Sachs boy. Drain the swamp. Right. Right. Hillary was pilloried because she gave speeches to Goldman Sachs. But. Trump goes out and gets waivers and hires people from Goldman Sachs directly to be our Commerce Secretary and to be our Secretary of the Treasury. And then when his name appeared on the dollar bills, his wife, with the really bad taste, okay, she wear the Birkin bag, the cheap. I researched it this weekend, and uh, the cheapest Birkin bag that you can buy, the the least expensive, ugly suitcase looking Birkin bag that you can buy was what? What was it? How fifteen thousand dollars? That's the cheapest one you could buy. And then from there, it goes up like if it's crocodile, you want your initials on it. Yeah, the price can go all the way up to like forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. And her Tom Ford leather gloves that she wore in the middle of the day, like some, some villain in a, 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 a 007 movie. And the two of them holding the sheets of money, and that doesn't disqualify them from anything to do with our money. Yeah, Steve Mnuchin, four to five hundred million dollars. And that's what we know about. Anyway, I digress. Uh, The president of the United States, who is worth several billion dollars, as you mentioned, some four or five thousand lobbyists doing Mm. everything that they could to write a bill which significantly benefits the wealthiest people in this country and the largest corporations. The latest analysis that we have seen suggests that 72 percent of the benefits go to the top 5 percent. My guess is that 60 percent of the benefits will go to the top 1 percent. And at the end of the decade, because the benefits for the middle class are temporary, while the corporate benefits are permanent, at the end of the decade, over half of the middle class will be paying more in taxes. Say, that's a good plan. Oh, and by the way, this bill that dropped on Friday, it doesn't even let our, you know, the, the unwashed masses tax cuts stay for 10 years. Oh, no, that would have exceeded the $1.5 trillion to the deficit mark and wouldn't have uh, allowed for the Republicans to vote out of regular order, which John McCain said was a no for him if they did out of regular order by uh, using reconciliation, which lowers the um, number of senators you need to a measly 50. So it's $1.46 trillion now. And if they would have allowed our measly little tax cuts to stay for 10 long years, then it would have put it over 1.5. So instead of doing something about the very wealthy uh, benefits. No, they went to the bottom and they penalized us. Therefore, our tax cuts will expire in only eight years instead of 10, while the corporate tax cut from 35% to 21% 
is permanent. What we are seeing here is a real massive a attack uh, on the middle class. And what I worry very much, John, is that if you listen to what the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, is talking about, what he is saying is that as a result of this bill, the deficit will go up by $1.4 trillion. And what Ryan, in my view, will come back with are massive cuts to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid in order to offset that deficit. So what makes him think that Paul Ryan is going to go after, um, you know, Medicare and Medicaid and uh, what he calls entitlements, which I call earned benefits? House hmm. Speaker Paul Ryan, he's already setting his sights on the next GOP project, entitlement reform. Oh. During a radio interview, Ryan placed Medicare and welfare reform at the top of his list. Oh. Listen. Listen. Frankly, it's the health care entitlements that are the big drivers of our debt. And then welfare reform, too. We think it's important to get people from welfare to work. We have a welfare system that's basically trapping people in poverty and effectively paying people not to work. And we've got to work on that. Oh, so it's not Bernie imagining. It's actually Paul Ryan saying that the next big project is to take away from you the safety net that exists currently, like um, subsidies to help you pay for your health care and uh, welfare benefits if you fall on some hard times while you're looking for work. Um, also, Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, Social Security, dare I say it. Yikes, man. And those are earned benefits. Those are not entitlements, although the GOP uh, says that they are. So they're transferring trillions of dollars from the middle class to the donor class so that the donor class can keep them in power. Wouldn't it be much simpler if we just said this is an oligarchy and just called it a day? Wouldn't it be much simpler? I say yes, it would be simpler. Jesus. For a commercial free, on demand, whenever, wherever listening experience, visit randyrhodes.com for your personal premium podcast today. Hey everybody, it's Brett from The Randy Road Show, and all I want for Christmas is an impeachment. But the next best thing is working at The Randy Road Show, and that can't happen without your support. Let's help Randy make this a hard truth holiday season, and she can't do that without your support. So please keep listening. And buy a stinking podcast. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders of The Laura Flanders Show. Watch every week on Free Speech TV, Link TV, YouTube, or if you're in New York, CUNY TV. Prefer to listen? Subscribe to the free podcast at lauraflanders.com. I end every week with a commentary. I call it the F word. Here's this week's. It's life or death for the Federal Communications Commission, and death may be the honest option. After all, the FCC's mission to regulate communications media in the public interest was forged long ago in a time very different from our own, and it's been beaten to a pulp by politicians of both parties over the last two decades. Now Donald Trump's FCC chair, Ajit Pai, wants to kill the wounded agency off, and he may have done it to all intents and purposes at the commission's meeting this December 14th. The history of the agency goes back to a time when new technology was bursting with potential and open to a use or abuse with devastating implications for democracy. Its mission was forged by movements long back who understood that the nation teetered on a brink. Would we be the land of misogyny, white supremacy, militarism, anti-Semitism, and anti-immigrant bias, or something better? At the time, world capitalism was accumulating unchecked. The social justice movements of the 1920s and 30s disagreed about a lot, but they understood from experience that no one of them stood a chance of shifting power or displacing arrogance without a functioning public information system. The future of the nation would only go one way, they said, if only those who could pay could have a say. In the 1940s, under FDR, the chairman of the FCC was a civil rights advocate, one of Rosa Parks' lawyers. Clifford Durr pursued media justice with a social justice passion because he and the movements at his back believed that diversity, localism, and competition were civil rights means to a civil, fair society. 
All these years on, decades of paid propaganda have many Americans convinced that government has no business meddling in the business of media. Social movements mostly don't get too involved in media regulation either because, well, they believe that, like the AFL-CIO or the NAACP, they can afford to buy big dollar ads on the big bosses' media and cross their fingers that the workers' message gets across unchanged. Reverse net neutrality, open the floodgates to more monopoly, Chairman Pai, a former staffer to Attorney General Jeff Jeff Sessions has in mind to accomplish all that and more, and he probably will. The FCC voted on net neutrality Thursday, reversed the neutral policy put in place by the Obama administration. But that's just the least of it. What surprises me isn't Pi or his pals, it's us. If we don't start learning from our history, and perhaps repeating some of it, we might as well start burning books. Anything with democracy in the title. Thanks. I'm Laura Flanders. Write to me, tell me what you think at Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. And thanks. All things Randy at randyrhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Look, at a time of massive income and wealth inequality, where the people on top and large corporations are doing phenomenally well, our job is to pay attention to the needs of working families. We talk about a child, a child care tax credit in this bill. Truth is that depending on where you live in America, good quality child care can cost twelve, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year. Our job is to move to universal child care so that every working family in this country knows that their kids have good quality care. Right now, John, if this is really quite unbelievable, while the Republicans are spending all of their time providing massive tax breaks to the rich. Mm. There has been no discussion, public discussion, about the dreamers, the needs of the dreamers. 800,000 young people born and raised in America are going to lose their me, legal status very shortly. What get, about the CHIP program? Right, and let me Nine get, million kids are going to lose their health insurance. Uh, uh, let me get to that in a second. But wow. if you Democrats take control, are corporate taxes going up? I think we're going to take a very hard look at this entire tax bill and make it a tax bill that works for the middle class and working families, but, not for the top 1% and large multinational corporations. But there's no question that, that in order to achieve all of the things you want, taxes are going to have to go up on corporations. If they're down to 21 as a result of this legislation, you can't find the money anywhere else. Absolutely, yes. So, okay. Abs- in my view, absolutely. Absolutely. And that is really what America wants. I mean, this thing has uh, the, the most... Uh, it, this is historic, actually. This bill is historically unpopular, even among Republican voters. Only 66 percent of Republican voters are for this plan uh, because they understand that what last week they took away our Internet and uh, now they're trying to take away our little meager, uh, you know, uh, uh, earnings. You know, uh, our, our wages haven't gone up in years and years and years. And I just don't think that the GOP voters who voted for Trump thinking he was going to drain the swamp are very, uh, you know, down with um, a billionaire who craps in a gold toilet uh, rewarding billionaires. I thought they, you know, I think they thought he was different. You know, he couldn't be bought. But it, you had five, six thousand lobbyists up on Capitol Hill writing in their little pet, uh, you know, uh, like carried interest. That loophole. This does not simplify the tax code. This just lowers the uh, uh, statutory rate for corporations from 35 to 21 percent. But the effective tax rate of corporations is below that, meaning what they actually pay is anywhere from 19 to 14. Some pay nothing, some get a refund. And what did they do here? There was an alternative minimum tax for corporations to ensure that they would pay something, uh, you know, and this is why they offshored their profits, right? And they've just repealed in this bill the alternative minimum tax for corporations and for individuals. So guys like Trump, who the only information we have about Trump's tax uh, ta- tax returns is the 2005 slip of paper uh, that uh, was uh, provided to uh, MSNBC uh, one day. Uh, and it looks like he paid the alternative minimum tax and that goes away, too. So he could actually pay nothing. 
So yes, he's benefiting uh, the most from this, and so are corporations benefiting the most from this. And what's really, really sick is that corporations are sitting right now on $2.3 trillion in cash reserves. And if they're already sitting on that and they haven't created higher wages for you, then you could just best believe that they're only going to use this extra, extra windfall to cushion their fat asses. That's it. This bill addressed everything that's wrong with our economy and made it worse. And it's not me that's saying it. Listen, I've been saving articles ever since this tax bill dropped. Here's one. This is, this is amazing. And yes, you, you need to hear this. This is uh, from the Washington Post. This is historian Robert McIlvain, who teaches uh, uh, at Millsaps College. And he is the author of a book called The Great Depression, America, 1929 to 41. Okay, I think this is his area of expertise, what causes Great Depressions and how to get out of them. He actually says people he actually says, quote, well, he's he's quoting William Jennings Bryan to open the article. He says there are two ideas of government. William Jennings Bryan declared in 1896 cross of it was called the cross of gold speech. So there's no video because it's 18 and 96. And also, uh, you know, in, in net neutrality has been overturned. So going forward, there will be no video too, right? Just so get used to it. It'll be just like 1896 around here. But he said, there are those who believe that if you will only legislate to make the well-to-do prosperous, their prosperity will leak through on those below. Oh, the democratic idea, however, has been that if you legislate to make the masses prosperous, their prosperity will find its way up through every class which rests upon them. That was more than three decades before the collapse of the economy in 1929. The crash followed a decade of Republican control of the federal government, during which the trickle-down policies, including massive tax cuts for the rich, produced the greatest concentration of income in the accounts of the richest, one-tenth of one percent, at any time between World War I and 2007, when trickle-down economics, tax cuts for the hyper-rich, and deregulation again resulted in another economic collapse. Yet the plain fact that the trickle-down approach has never worked leaves Republicans unfazed. The GOP has been singing from the market is God hymnal for well over a century, telling us that deregulation, tax cuts for the rich, and the concentration of ever more wealth in the bloated accounts of the richest people will result in prosperity for the rest of us. The party is now trying to pass a scam that throws a few crumbs to the middle class temporarily, Millions of middle class Americans will soon see a tax hike if the bill is enacted while heaping benefits on the super rich, multiplying the national debt and endangering the American economy. As a historian of the Great Depression, I can say I've seen this show before. In 1926, Calvin Coolidge's Treasury Secretary, Andrew Mellon, one of the world's richest men, thanks Steve Mnuchin, pushed through a massive tax cut that would substantially contribute to the causes of the Great Depression. Republican Senator George Norris of Nebraska said that Mellon himself would reap from the tax bill, quote, a larger personal reduction in tax taxes than in the aggregate of practically all the taxpayers in the state of Nebraska. The same is true now of Donald Trump, the Koch brothers, Sheldon Adelson, and other fabulously rich people. During the 1920s, Republicans almost literally worshipped business. Quote, the business of America, Coolidge proclaimed, is business. Coolidge also remarked that, quote, the man who builds a factory builds a temple and the man who works there worships there. That faith in the market is God has been the Republican religion ever since. A few months after he became president in 1981, Ronald Reagan praised Coolidge for cutting taxes four times and said, quote, we probably had the greatest growth in prosperity than we've ever known. Reagan said nothing about what happened to Coolidge prosperity a few months after he left office. But in 1932, in the depths of the global depression, Franklin D. Roosevelt called for, quote, 
bold, persistent experimentation and said, quote, it is common sense to take a method and try it. And if it fails, admit it, frankly, and try another. But above all, try something. The contrasting position of Republicans then and now is take the method and try it. And if it fails, deny its failure and try it again and again and again. And I am adding and and expect a different result. When Bill Clinton proposed a modest increase in the top marginal tax rate in 1993, every Republican voted against it. Trickle-down economists proclaimed that it would lead to an economic disaster. But the tax increase on the wealthy was followed by one of the greatest periods of prosperity in American history and resulted in a budget surplus. When the Republicans came back to power in 2001, the administration of George W. Bush pushed the opposite policies, which had invariably produced calamity in the past, and predictably that happened again in 2008. Just how disastrous would the proposed reincarnation of the failed Republican trickle-down policies of the past be for the American people and the future of our nation? Here's a few ways. Repealing the estate tax, or as Republicans have dubbed it, the death tax. But the estate tax is not on the dead. It is an attack on their very alive heirs. Repeal will reverse an important aspect of the American Revolution and establish an American hereditary aristocracy. If your estate is not above 11 million currently, your benefits from this portion of the GOP's tax cut would be a nice round number. Zero. They just raised that, by the way, since this was written to $22 million. Eliminating the deductions for state and local taxes, the GOP has called these deductions favoritism for people who live in high-tax states. Translation, everybody, blue states. Because blue states invest in education, blue states invest in infrastructure, and blue states have to send their money to the red states so they don't die. In fact, ending deductibility of state and local taxes would tax income that's already been taxed away from a taxpayer. It is quite simply double taxation. Repealing the alternative minimum tax, which happened here, that assures that wealthy people who hire accountants to find all the obscure ways to avoid taxes cannot escape taxation altogether. Repealing it would save Trump millions. It will also save corporations millions because now, since this has been written, they've repealed the corporate alternative minimum tax in this bill. Okay, extending the pass-through provision in non-corporate businesses, including some 500 entities that Trump owns, it would allow the owners of these businesses to pay taxes at 20% instead of 39.9. This provision would allow a Wall Street fund manager, a hedge fund manager, and other very wealthy people to pay a lower tax rate than their secretaries. Ending the deductibility of large medical expenses. Taxing waived tuition for college students. Okay, they didn't do that, so I'm going to skip. But they did do the Affordable Care Act's individual mandate. They killed it, right? Which would cause 13 million Americans to lose health insurance as a result. In, and, and as a result, much higher premiums for those who do get their insurance through the exchanges. Hello, everybody. That would be me. That would be Brett. The Congressional Budget Office has indicated that if enacted, the Republican tax bill will force deep cuts in Medicare through a generally unknown budget rule that its deficits would trigger. Yes, it's called PAYGO. Bernie spoke about that, too. We can play that for you. But anyway, the analysis of the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office found that people making less than $100,000 a year, which is approximately 80% of American households, will have their taxes increased, while millionaires and billionaires will make off like bandits. In the 1920s, Republicans were in full control of the federal government and used that power to pursue their objective to, quote, make the well-to-do prosperous, and it didn't, quote, leak through on those below. In that decade, the mass production American economy became dependent on mass consumption. And for it to work, the masses needed a sufficient share of the national income to be able to consume what is being produced. It's the same as it is today. Republican policies in the 1920s instead pushed to concentrate more of the income at the top. Ninety years later, 
Republicans are doing it again, and they are sprinting toward an economic cliff. Another round of government of the people by the Republicans for the super rich will be catastrophic. The American people must call it a halt before it's too late. So prepare yourself, everybody. Prepare yourself. Here's Bernie talking about Paygo. The Republicans, when Democrats have said Medicare is going to have to be cut because of the so-called Paygo rules, uh, that what Republicans say is Democrats are going to waive those rules next year, that those Paygo rules are always waived. And so it's kind of a false attack to say that they're going to be automatic cuts for Medicare. Your response? No, it is not a false attack, John, is simply listening to what the Speaker of the House has said. And what he has said is, after they do this tax bill, the next order of business is so-called entitlement reform. And please understand that when Republicans talk about entitlement reform, what they are talking about are massive cuts to Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. In the budget that they already passed, they proposed a trillion dollar cut to Medicaid which would be disastrous for people who have loved ones in nursing homes, Mm. for children, and for working families who are on Medicaid. This is what they have already proposed. So they are going to come back, in my view, in order to offset this deficit with terrible cuts uh, to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. I, uh, I heard Paul Ryan say it too. I heard it with my own ears. I saw it with my own eyes. But hey, don't believe what you see and hear. Oh, no, believe that the Republicans who have been practicing trickle down economics for 90 years each time they are in the majority and each time they practice it, it fails. And each time they do it, we go into a great recession and or depression. Just believe that they'll be right this one last time. Morons. This is a donor-sponsored, donor-lobbied bill. Who pays the lobbyists? Lobbyists don't make money from the government. Lobbyists make money from their clients. And their clients pay them to lobby on the tax code to keep all the loopholes and to get rid of the things they don't like that confronts them after they exhaust all the loopholes like the alternative minimum tax. There were four to 6,000 lobbyists up on Capitol Hill working this bill. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes Air Force. Air 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 Force. RandyRhodes.com. Hi, this is Scotty, Randy's producer here to remind you it's December, a month that's known for its holidays. You got your Christmas, your Hanukkah, your Kwanzaa, your Boxing Day, Festivus. No matter what holiday you celebrate, it's a time we all come together with our families and friends. And since you're all my family and friends, I like to wish each and every one of you a happy slash merry holidays of your choice. Now, if you're still looking for the perfect gift, I, Scotty, got you covered. Go to randyroads.com and buy your friends or family a stinking podcast. Think about it. What better way to show your loved ones that you really care than sharing with them the knowledge of truth and facts? And if you can't stand the people in your life, but you still want to do something great for the holidays, here's an idea for you. Support the show. By supporting The Randy Road Show, you help keep us going into the new year. And if 2017 was a sign of things to come, we'll need Randy more than ever. Go to randyroads.com to buy a stinking podcast and or support the show. Happy holidays, jerky fans. Herky Jerky knows it's the season to enjoy the world's best jerky and meat sticks, and they want you to save a bundle while doing it. Herky Jerky, first of all, would like to thank you all, all you fiercely loyal customers, because they had their most successful year thanks to you, despite Mother Nature doing its worst. Jason at Herky Jerky is so grateful that you enjoy his products, and everyone at Herky Jerky is so glad to provide them. So, as a special thank you, Herky Jerky is serving up their best offer of the year for Christmas giving. $10 off any order of 60 or more or $15 off any order $100 or more without a promo code. Just visit herkyjerky.com. And the now famous bacon jerky, new fat-free and delicious turkey jerky, and all four of the new nitrite and preservative-free flavors plus good old beef jerky and all the exotic game jerkies make perfect holiday gifts. 
buffalo, elk, venison sticks, three different varieties of beef smokies, all make great stocking stuffers. So choose your favorites now. Take advantage of the savings, which also includes free shipping on any two packs or more. Everyone at Herky Jerky would like to wish a safe and happy holiday season to all of you. And thank you once again for your loyalty. This offer starts today and it goes through all of December. Happy holidays from HerkyJerky.com. The Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Now. Okay, a little housekeeping. Uh, Herky Jerky, Jason wants to let you know that if you order your jerky gift uh, for your Christmas giving today, it will get to whoever you are ordering it for, whether it's yourself or your recipient, by Christmas. But today is the last day to order Herky Jerky and get it to you or your recipient, your gift recipient, by Christmas. Also, the Randy Road Show would like to tell you that this is the last week we will be broadcasting in 2017. Uh, we will be off next week uh, so that everyone can be with their loved ones uh, for the conclusion of Hanukkah. No, for Christmas and New Year's. Yes. So... Please do support the show with your year-end uh, purchases and gifts. Of course, the gift podcast goes immediately to your recipient. If you remember to put their email address in at checkout, it will generate their coupon for them instantly. So you can do that right up to uh, Christmas Day. Anyway, uh, I digress. So, uh, But it is important uh, for Jason to let you know that if you order Herky Jerky, he can get it to whoever you'd like by Christmas if you order today. Here's the remainder of Bernie's commentary on uh, Face the Nation. So that's slightly different, though, than, than following through on the restrictions created by PAYGO, which they say you'll waive. But let me ask you this question about the spending bill. Keep the government open. It. What's your message to Democratic leaders about how tough, how, how and what they should fight for uh, in terms of keep it, funding the government? Look, right now, it is no secret that the middle class is hurting. Uh, the Republicans have been unable to reauthorize, for example, the Community Health Center program, providing health care to 27 million Americans. Jesus. The CHIP programs, the Children's Health Insurance Program. They have ignored the fact that for three months, the CHIP program for 9 million children in this country has not been funded. We have a crisis in pensions in this country. Million and a half hardworking people who are promised their pensions are going to see their pensions reduced by 50 or 60 percent. We have a rural infrastructure crisis where people can't even get broadway. We have 30,000 vacancies in the Veterans Administration that have not been filled. Our job is to take care of the needs of working families and the middle class, not just worry about the 1%. So I believe that as we talk about the new spending bill, those are the issues we must demand that Republicans address. You know what's so interesting? You know, when you listen to um, these numbers go by, you know, it's it's kind of uh, startling. But then when you actually sit there and listen and write down the numbers, like the 9 million children that hadn't been, you know, their CHIP health insurance plan hasn't been funded. And so 9 million uh, families are getting notices in the mail right now saying that their children are losing their health insurance under the CHIP program. Then you add in uh, the 50 million people who don't have broadband in this country. And then you add in uh, the 27 million people who get their health care through community hospitals. And then you add in the 13 million people uh, right now who are uh, uh, looking at, uh, you know, cuts to their, um, their, their the, the, the pensions and all the things they were. I mean, you're talking about 59 million and then another 50 million without broadband. You're talking about 100 million people that are affected out of that's like one in three people in this country that are getting stiffed by this administration. And it just blows your mind. I mean, you just sit there and do the math. You hear these numbers go by, go by, go by. But you don't realize there's only 350 million people in this entire country. So if you're talking about things that are going to affect 109 million people in a negative way, you're talking about legislation that is hurting a third of this country. Why are they choosing to do this? They're choosing to do this simply because the donor class is able to affect the legislation where the 100 million people who are just trying to scrape by can't. So you've got the donor class. What do they do? 
they hire lobbyists and they pay those lobbyists a thousand dollars an hour can you afford to pay somebody a thousand dollars an hour well that's what they do and then those lobbyists are like the, the 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 flying monkeys in the wizard of oz they're released on capitol hill and they're in every single office every single office and on top of it the cherry on the cake of the day of the senator is the lobbyists will do a combi pack okay we want the alternative minimum tax removed and we'll do a fundraiser for you we'll do a fundraiser for you at charlie palmer's we could do a breakfast fundraiser a lunch fundraiser and even a dinner fundraiser and we can raise a couple million dollars in an afternoon so on top of it uh, you know, you know that our donor isn't going to give you another nickel, but we can actually, on the positive side, raise five, six million dollars for you in one day. Whose side are you on here? That's what lobbyists do. And I know because I live with one retired. Thank God. I don't know how many people know this, but there is a list of the top 50 lobbyists in the country that is put out every single year. Do you know that Howard was number 41 I think I know what I'm talking about over here, like how it works. I've been to these fundraisers. I've been to tobacco lobbyists' mansions. I have seen senators drink from ice sculptures from the bottom of the table with the vodka dripping from the American Eagle's beak into their mouth. Conservative Republican senators making an ass of themselves. I have seen it all, baby. I have heard it all. I have seen it all. I have been the witness to our execution many times. And it's all about money. And those lobbyists could be the most decent people in the world, but they have to fill out timesheets. And they have to bill. And they have to show that they have spent many, many hours lobbying against the repeal of the, uh, of the uh, uh, what do you call that one? The earned interest, the carried interest. By the way, the carried interest loophole is one of the most disgusting loopholes there is. And that allows for people with great wealth to put off this year paying taxes on the interest they earned and instead put it off to years going forward to the point where they never pay it. And that's still in the tax code. That was not lobbied out. I mean, that was not, uh, you know, um, uh, gotten rid of. The lobbyists made sure they stood there like the wall because I have seen those phone calls come from very wealthy people. Uh, I have seen them come to the lobbyists, the phone call go, you better get your ass in there and keep that carried interest loophole. You better freaking do it or you're fired. I swear to God, I've seen it. So it's still in there. This is sick and sad, but it's true. Amy and Hope Sound. Oh, my gosh. Hi, Randy. Hi, Amy. While I was on hold, I got to look it up. It was Lewis Black um, on Stephen Colbert on December 2nd. And it's on YouTube, and I typed in trickle-down economics analogy, and it came right up. Anyways, I don't know if I should tell you if I should just let you look it up and play it. What Play what? Oh, I'm sorry. I had a, a, a trickle-down economics analogy that I heard on Stephen Colbert. It was Lewis Black. It's oh, like Lewis Black. Oh, oh, yeah, it's yeah. Hilarious. The way he, it's hilarious. It's a great analogy. I cracked up. But I looked it up while I was on hold. So. I, 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 I'm having a tough time playing things lately. Uh, so go, okay. go ahead and tell well, them. I'll, I'll give you the basics of it. Then. It's uh, that, um, okay, you put a bucket between your legs. You stand there with your pants on and pee down your pants <laughs> and see how much of it trickles into the bucket. That's trickle-down economics. Very nice. Anyways, I love Lewis can, Black. <laughs> I do, too. I love him. I love Stephen Colbert, and I cracked up, and I didn't think he was going to put me on the air, but I at least had time to look it up while I was on there, so... I, I can't tell it as good as he did. You know, it's like a six-minute clip. So. Well, you just have so to I get really show. angry and let it all come out through your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I love your show, and I love you guys. And if there, I live nearby, so if you ever need anything, call me. I'll be glad to come out and volunteer for stuff Will you guys do. do. Thank you. Far away. Thank you for everything you do, and have a wonderful Hanukkah. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy New Year. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you. Bonnie in Des Moines. Hi, Randy. Hi, Bonnie. I'm Bonnie Gusslin in Des Moines, and I'm a real estate specialist, and yeah. I'm already seeing the great big cracks 
starting in our marketplace for real estate. Yes, the, you're, the, real, the Realtors Association is so against this freaking bill. I mean, they are... Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not a realtor. I'm an appraiser broker. Right. I've been an appraiser for 40 years. And I have seen everything go up and down mm-hmm. at 17% interest rate. I was appraising then. We paid for the Vietnam War with that 17% interest rate. But right now I'm starting to see the cracks like I did in 2006. I and my relocation, executive relocation specialist, we work with the corporate people being transferred in and out of Iowa. And we started seeing the cracks in 2006. And I'm seeing again now. And um, I am VA appraiser, and I get uh, information from the Veterans Administration. Our veterans have the unemployment rate has gone up over the last year, over 2017, from 2.7% to 4% with Trump. And I I don't see any help going that way again. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm starting to do markets on low-end homes in our Des Moines marketplace, and I'm starting to see decreases in the average sale price from the year previously. This is stuff I do is stats. I do it all day long, mm-hmm. and I'm just starting to see the cracks, and it's the new Great Depression that the Republican filth is bringing to us. That's what I call them yeah. anymore. I can't refer to them as anything else, but... Yeah, I mean, I hear you, and and everybody that's looked at it agrees with you, and and you're seeing what you're seeing, and you're hearing what you're hearing, and you're appraising what you're appraising, and yet you've got the Republicans telling you, let's do the same bad thing over again and expect a different result, and that's the definition of insanity, and this crazy loop of the echo chamber on the conservative media, the radio, the uh, the Fox News, uh, the thousands of uh, you know fake websites, the Gateway pundits, the Breitbart's, the Drudge Reports, they are telling somebody, they're, they're telling ordinary people, you know, live in our alternate reality and believe us that this time will be different. It can't be different. We are lowering taxes. We're still in a time of war. You have a president that's threatening another war, uh, you know, either in uh, North Korea or Iran or whatever. Uh, you know, a nuclear war, a, a showdown. And, you know, Marco uh, Marco Rubio, you have uh, Paul Ryan telling us they're going to go after Medicare and Medicaid, that there are half a trillion dollar cuts to Medicare. There's a trillion dollar cut to Medicaid. And it's all going to be OK. It can't possibly be okay. If you have nine, it's not going to be okay. I'm 66. I paid for 40 years in it. That paid for my parents. That paid for me and my husband. Yeah. We were both on Medicare now. Yeah. I was going to retire in four years. I don't know if I can retire. I'm, I'm, I'm very popular now because all my uh, expert friends retired already. So in the corporate work, I'm getting a lot of good work. So I'm keeping with it. But I don't want to take my 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 future, my last few years of appraising and just do foreclosures because that's what's going to happen because it's going to start the foreclosures. The banksters are going to steal people's homes again, and I'm so angry. I, I spent the last two weeks I've been calling almost every other day to my representatives, and I recommend for everybody that's listening to you to do that. I was crying when I ended my calls to my three representatives, and they kind of know me now. You know, yeah. they understand. I've told them everything, and um, they under. You know, they were they're listening, but they work for Republican people. I know, they're I know. Filth. They're just all filth. I, I can say that, can't I, on the radio? <laughs> well, they're going to do it to us again. I mean, there's just no question about it. And so, uh, the idea that you know they uh, truly hold these beliefs uh, that the middle class will somehow be better off is is total bullcrap either they're so ignorant that they don't know recent history from 2008 and they certainly don't remember the uh, roaring 20s that led to a great depression uh they don't remember you know uh, uh, that ronald reagan uh, redistributed wealth to the very top and that you know people were snorting cocaine off of their secretary's ass in a limousine down on wall street and that it's all going to happen again um Either they're in complete and utter denial, or they are selling a load of filth to ordinary Americans. Yeah, and I, I you know, I can't talk about it when I was uh, when I'm working. But if some veteran asks me, well, why are we going? When we went through the last recession with Bush, they uh, they would ask me, why is this happening? And so I went through. Well, in 2003, the Republicans took 
the president and the Congress took away all the um, rules and regulations, and anybody that was walking that chewed gum and um, coughed could get a, a loan. And then it all collapsed. Right. So once you explain to them the simple truth of how the laws change, they understood. I think I helped President Obama get elected <laughs> <laughs> in those years when they, what's going on? What's going on? Yeah. Well, I told them the truth. Listen, it's the same thing. It's deregulation. Look at what they did to the Consumer Protection Bureau, you know, that uh, Elizabeth Warren fought so hard to get set up to protect homeowners from the banksters. And he, he, he puts, uh, what's his face? Uh, you know, the same guy is running like two agencies. Mick Mulvaney, he puts him in charge of the Consumer Protection Bureau so that it is toothless now, once again, deregulates the banks once again. I, I, I mean, it's, it's the same thing, lowering taxes for the very wealthy and deregulating the banks in a time of war cannot work for middle class people. And it's not going to work. It's never going to work. And I wish people would just wake up and just start learning what's going to happen to them. Well, uh, you know, I appreciate your call very, very much. But I have to say there are some people in this country that are just so out of the loop. Uh, and the short attention span that we have in this country means that a lot of people don't even remember 2008, let alone the Roaring Twenties or the Great Depression or the Reagan years. I mean, if you can't remember that you lost your house in 2008 because of the deregulation of the banks and the lowering of the taxes and that this economy went right off the cliff, then God help you. Uh, I, I think the only thing standing in the way between you and another Great Depression is me. So listen, even if you disagree, Pay attention. This could save your life. Go to RandyRoads.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast.